Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about ethical design considerations in your instructional design work. So we're going to be talking about things such as accessibility, privacy, intellectual property rights, and inclusivity and diversity. So my name is Shantae Skildager, and I will be your host for our session today. Let's get started with just making sure that we understand what it means to apply these ethical design considerations into our work processes as instructional designers. So when we're talking about ethical design considerations, what we're talking about is making sure that the learning experiences that we create that we are following the laws and the regulations to the best of our abilities, and that we are creating learning experiences that make everyone feel welcome and valued and respected as a part of that experience. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to explore some of the key ethical design considerations that we need to factor into our instructional design processes. Now, obviously, there are more than the four that we are about to cover. So just know that these are not all inclusive, but these are four key design considerations that you should be thinking about and implementing in your instructional design process. So the four that we're going to be covering today, again, we're going to talk about accessibility. We're going to talk about privacy, intellectual property rights, and inclusivity and diversity. Let's go ahead and jump in with accessibility. As instructional designers, we want to make sure that the learning experiences that we create are accessible to all learners who might consume the learning experience. So to do this, we really have to factor the needs of learners who have visual or auditory or cognitive or physical impairments. So we need to be thinking about that and designing with those factors in mind. So what are some things that we can do if somebody has a visual impairment or a hearing impairment, or maybe they're not able to click, right? These are things that we need to factor in. And we need to factor that into all of the materials that we create, what that experience or in that environment feels like, what technologies that we're going to be using. So we're going to make sure that we are providing alternative formats for people with different needs, right? So we want to make sure that we are making learning experiences and using tools that are compatible with assistive technologies. So things like screen readers, right? A lot of times we'll have learners in our programs or who are participating in our online experiences who have visual impairments. So they often use screen readers. So we need to make sure that the tools that we're bringing in for them to consume this learning experience would be compatible with a screen reader. We also want to make sure that we are creating content that is perceivable, it's operable, it's understandable, and it's robust, right? So we're using that poor standard to help guide our instructional design process. So accessibility is a big factor for us as instructional designers. And let's talk about how this might actually show up for us in our work. So it might be something like providing accurate and synchronized closed captions so that somebody who is watching a video can toggle on those closed captions and follow along. Or maybe if we're not able to do the closed captions, we're providing a transcript. Or maybe we are working with an international audience where English is in a first language. So again, those closed captions and those transcripts become very important as a resource to make this learning experience and this content accessible. It's also helpful to account for who the different speakers are. So here on the screen, you can see that it says Shantae, so you know who I am. If I were co-presenting with Katie, it would say Katie, so that you always know who the speakers are as you're participating in these learning experiences. If we're creating online learning, e-learning, then we want to try to avoid interactions like the drag and drop that require mobility in order to use those, where you click 
and you pull and you drag on something, right? And then you let it go in certain places. So people that have issues with their hands, that becomes a little bit harder. We also want to make sure that we are creating things that like shortcuts or hotkeys or different ways of accessing that content. And then providing just alternative ways for people to consume content. If we are in a learning environment and it's online and somebody can't use a computer, maybe instead we give them a copy of the slides and the speaker notes so that they could go through and read it because they can't access online. Sometimes we work with learners who have seizures and certain kinds of lights or actions on the screen can be a trigger for a seizure. So we might want to give them the learning experience in a different modality. So as instructional designers, we're often having to factor in all these different things to make sure that we are creating a learning experience that is accessible to everyone. Another thing that we want to factor in as instructional designers is privacy. Privacy is all about respecting the confidentiality of the personal information of our learner, right? So we have to handle this information responsibly. We often use data as instructional designers. We collect data in things like our end of course surveys. We collect our performance data when somebody takes one of our assessments. So we're capturing information about people and we are using that to inform us of different things, right? Like we want to collect information to make that learning experience better. We're collecting information about assessments to one, make sure that somebody has demonstrated proficiency in that topic, but also to help guide us as instructional designers how to improve that assessment question. So we just want to make sure that that information does not get in the hands of other people. So we've got to handle that information responsibly. So the way that we can make sure that we're being responsible with data is we can limit the data to only collecting what is absolutely necessary. So if we are doing an end of course assessment, for example, do we really need their name? Do we need their email address? What is it that we really need? The tool itself will capture that performance data. So we don't have to capture it anywhere else. If they're doing a survey, do we need their email address? A lot of times if we're using Google Forms, it gives us an option where we can collect that. But do we really need it? So we want to make sure that we only collect what we need. We also want to make sure that we communicate how it's going to be used. So in one of the programs that we participate in, we always tell them like, hey, this information for this survey, this feedback, this is for your use only. We're not going to distribute that to your colleagues or your boss or anything like that. So be honest in this feedback that you give us. It's not going to be used as a part of your performance appraisal process or anything like that. It's just for your information so that you can use it and grow from it. So it's important that we communicate how that information is going to be shared. And then once we do collect it, we want to make sure that we are in integrity with what we said about how it was going to be used. So we want to make sure that we are protecting that information, that we are not sharing that. We have it in a secure folder, in a secure area of our drive, and that no one can access that information that should not have access to it. And then this last thing that you hear on the screen is all about regulations and laws. Now, before I jump into this, I have to tell you, I'm not a lawyer. I am not giving out legal advice. I've never been to a class on the laws related to regulations and instructional design. So all that I am sharing with you are my opinions and my experiences. And if you ever do need legal advice, then I would encourage you to seek out the legal counsel in the organization that you are working with. All right, so back to the regulations that we have here. It's interesting because as instructional designers, we are often designing learning experiences for international audiences. If you work in a company that is global, you might be developing for you know, the European market, you might be developing for the Asian market. So we have to not only understand the regulations and the laws of the land here in the United States where I am, but if I am serving a learner that let's say is in Italy, then I need to know, or at least be familiar with what those regulations are. 
The same is true for states. In Europe, we've got the GDPR, which is the general data protection regulation that we need to be familiar with. You probably see in some of your online courses or even websites, like there's disclaimers about how you're using information that you have to check off. Yes, that's all a part of that GDPR. And then in California, there's also the Consumer Privacy Act. So we've got the CCPA that we also have to be mindful of if we're designing learning experiences for people in the state of California. Now, you're not expected to be an expert in anything, but you do need to have some basic understanding of these things. And these are easy to look up. You can go out, you can Google these, and you'll find information about them. Now, the next topic that I want to cover with you is intellectual property rights. And what these are referring to are the rights that are granted to the creators or the owners of the original work. So this is my content. So this would be my intellectual property that we are looking at right now. And this can apply to text. It can apply to images, video, multimedia resources, and it can apply to a variety of things. So as instructional designers, it's really essential that we are respecting the rights or the intellectual property rights of the people that created that original content. We wouldn't ever want to like go out and grab that and put that into our learning experience and pretend like that's ours. This is a lot of what we're hearing about some of the negativity around chat GPT. People are worried that intellectual property rights are being violated and that chat GPT is scraping information that it shouldn't. Now, if you go out to ChatGPT or OpenAI's website, they tell you that they don't do that, but they do train with the data that you put into ChatGPT. So I think it's a little bit borderline there for me about the intellectual property rights. So I, I personally am very careful about what I put into ChatGPT. Now, back to ethical design considerations and intellectual property rights. Again, we're not lawyers. We're not giving legal advice. We're just giving our experiences but we wanna make sure that we are respecting the intellectual property rights of the people who created the content that we want to somehow pull into our learning experiences. And the way that we can be mindful and respectful of intellectual property rights, or some of the ways, not all, but these are a handful, we can make sure that we always seek permission for using copyrighted content. You can often go out to a website and you'll see what their copyright rules are. It might very clearly or explicitly say, ask for permission to use this content and give you an email address. Or it might say, hey, this you can use this in these settings. So you just want to make sure that you are always respecting copy law rights and intellectual property rights, okay? We also want to make sure that we comply with fair use guidelines or openly licensed resources. Now, there are many guidelines around fair use. So again, you can go out and Google that. But simply what that means is fair use allows for some limited use of copyrighted materials without asking for permission. So sometimes you'll see what those usages are. So for example, there are some photo sites out there that say you can use these images, but you need to give attribution. So you can use that image, but you need to make sure that you're sourcing who the photographer was and following all those different guidelines. Or maybe they'll allow you to use music and somewhere you need to cite the source for that resource. So you always want to check what the fair use requirements are for that resource that you are using. If you go out to Wiki Images, for example, you'll see that they always list like how you can use that image. So you always want to follow that. And if in doubt, ask, always ask for permission. Again, there are multiple guidelines, several if you go out and look at that. And then there are a couple of other things that we can do to make sure that we aren't infringing on somebody's intellectual property rights. And that is you can create your own content or maybe you use a subscription service in the, where you license everything. So for example, we use Envato Elements at the instructional design company, and I don't have any affiliation with them other than we use them. So with that, I can license every image to each project that I use or music or a PowerPoint presentation or some kind of icon or the iconology that I download. I can license all of that by project, by client, 
and then I have the permissions to use that. All right. So you just want to make sure that you are always being respectful of these things and checking. Never turn that eye and just pretend like, oh, I'm just going to turn my cheek. I'm going to pretend like I don't know what that is. You always want to check. It's just good practice. I have worked in, in a company where a lot of the content that we created, there was a real fine line about what we could write, what we could say, what we couldn't say. So we had a lot of legal scrutiny on our content. And so that helped me get better about respecting intellectual property rights and copyright laws. So inclusivity and diversity. This is designing learning experiences that really consider the uniqueness of each of our individual learners that are participating in our learning experiences. So this can include things like cultural backgrounds, their different preferences, what are their needs, what are the different perspectives that they have that they can bring into this learning experience. So as the instructional designer, it's really important that we make space for people to bring in their different experiences that we consider the cultural differences and backgrounds are, that we are embracing diversity in this learning experience and making everyone feel valued and respected in this. There are many ways that you can do this, but there's a few big ones that we want to be mindful of. We need to be mindful of the language that we are using, that it's not exclusive to any group. We want to be mindful of the imagery that we're using, the music that we are using, right? You know, we want to make sure that our personal biases are not rolling into the learning experiences that we create or any stereotypes that we have. So it's really good to have other people from different backgrounds as a part of your review team so they can help call out these things for you. But we all have to do a little bit of our own work to help uncover our stereotypes and uncover our biases so that we can be better about creating inclusive learning experiences that are not excluding any groups of people. All right. And we also want to make sure, again, as a part of inclusivity, that we are accommodating, again, the different needs and abilities of our learners. We don't ever want to be in a situation where we've created a learning experience that just by the nature of that experience, that we exclude them. Because when we do this, what we are doing is we are blocking their access to equal learning opportunities that can help them grow as an employee in the organization, right? And we would never want to do this intentionally. And we certainly don't want to find ourselves in a situation or set up the company to be in a situation where there might be legal challenges because we didn't create those equal opportunities. So we just want to make sure that we are always looking at taking a step back and looking at our content through an inclusive lens to the best of our ability. And we want to make sure that we are creating experiences that are designed for diversity. And sometimes that means that we need to turn over this content to someone else to get feedback, to get their unbiased feedback. So super important that we put in some different steps, different layers to help us really make sure that we are being inclusive and that we're creating diverse experiences for our learners where everyone is feeling welcome, everyone is feeling respected, and everyone is feeling valued. All right, so then the last thing that I would like to cover are risk. We are talking about like all these things that we can do, these ethical design considerations, but what happens if we don't do these things? What are the risks or what are the consequences? So if we're not considering ethical design implications in our instructional design work, then we might accidentally exclude learners, whether that's accessibility exclusion or it's a diversity exclusion, or we are, we are perpetuating, excluding marginalized communities. Like we've just got to be very careful about what we do. We never want to exclude anyone. We want to have everyone who wants to participate in our learning experience able to participate. Breach of privacy is another one that can 
occur if we're not careful, right? So if we're not taking care of the data that we've collected, well, that can actually accidentally get leaked out. Maybe a manager sees some feedback or performance data, and then they take that and they use it in a performance review and that person doesn't get all fives and get that promotion or they don't get the raise or the raise isn't as high as it would have been had their manager not seen that information. So there can be some really negative consequences if information gets out or if there's you know other types of personal identifying information, which we call a P, then there's the risk of identity theft or somebody using information that they shouldn't for some other type of gain. So we've just got to be very careful. And then loss of trust and reputation if we're not being inclusive, if we're not creating experiences that are accessible. Well, as that spreads throughout the organization, our senior leaders might hear that we excluded somebody in the process and there is an HR complaint that's filed against the department. So we're losing credibility. Our reputation is being harmed and we want to be strategic partners in in creating behavior change or influencing important key performance metrics within the organization. So we don't want to have a low reputation or a damaged reputation. So doing these things to make sure that we are considering all these different ethical components can help improve our reputation and enhance our reputation. So these are things that are important. And then the last one, discrimination and bias, right? So if we're giving insufficient attention to inclusivity and diversity in our instructional design process, then that can lead to that perpetuation of bias and discrimination. And we might create an experience that inadvertently reinforce stereotypes or disadvantages a community even more, right? So there are a lot of real risk related to ethics and instructional design if we're not being mindful of those. Let me say one last thing as we close this out. The impact you leave matters more than your intention. And what I mean by that is we all have these really great intentions about all the things that we want to do, but sometimes we just miss the mark. We've totally missed the boat, right? It might not be my intention to exclude somebody but the impact is that they feel excluded and think about how that might feel for them. It might not be my intention that I create a learning experience that isn't accessible, but think about the impact to that person who can't access that learning experience because I didn't take a little bit more time to think about how to make that accessible. So impact is more important than your intention. Most of us come from a really good place. Our intentions are good. We want to do good. And if we had just thought about it a little bit more or asked somebody else for their opinion on something, we might have done something different. But because we didn't do that, we had a very negative impact on someone else. So just think about that as you're thinking about what you might do differently. All right. I want to thank everyone for being here with me today. It has been really great to go through this content with you. And if you are watching this on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you will get a notification whenever we release our next content. All right. Thanks. Bye.